Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a small room for a big subject, um, but welcome uh, uh, to this session on, on news avoidance, uh, practical strategies for countering news avoidance. I'm Nick Newman. I'm a senior research associate at the Royce Institute for the Study of Journalism. And I'm Ellen Heinrichs. I'm the founder and CEO of the Bonn Institute. And we're going to have a conversation, and we're going to talk about these seven uh, strategies, and I think Everyone in the room, judging by the number of people here, are familiar with the, the problem. There's a number of, of sessions here in Perugia. Uh, I think journalists in the data see the problem of news avoidance, news fatigue every day. But the point of this session is not to endlessly discuss the problem again, but to try to outline uh, some practical ways in which we can start to deal with it. So Ellen and I are going to have a conversation with some slides and some specific examples and initiatives. And wherever possible, we've tried to include uh, evidence about whether these, data, these, these approaches have actually worked and what people have learned. Uh, you don't necessarily need to take notes. We, we've uh, written an article version of this for the Royce Institute website. It'll also be on the Bonn Institute website later. Um, but we also know there's some really smart people in the room, uh, so we'd love to know what you've tried, what you've worked, for, uh, what's worked for you, and we'll try and, and make sure that we leave time for, for your input and questions. Um, Ellen. Yeah, um, you said we're also talking about evidence, so I think the first part is to look for evidence in the room, and I'm like really interested in who in the room is avoiding the news from time to time, say once a week, please raise your hand. And you're journalists, right? And you're journalists. <laughs> and you're so average, because I think this is pretty much one third of the room, right? Exactly. <laughs> so um, before we get really constructive about it and talk about solutions um, to our news avoidance, we should really dig a little bit into the problem. Uh, sure. And um, so the Royce Institute, as you know, uh, has been studying this for a number of years. Um, what does the research show? So um, in our data, uh, the proportion that say, this is 2023 data, uh, the proportion that say they avoid the news sometimes or often is about um, over a third across 46 different countries. That's considerably up on uh, 2017, as you can see. In some countries like the UK, it's literally doubled. Uh, it's disproportionately younger, disproportionately women, and those from a low educational background. Um, now, to some extent, it's an understandable reaction to what's going on in the world. Um, uh, as this comment shows, people feel they need to protect themselves in, in, in some ways. Uh, maybe these are things that we can't control as journalists. Um, but I think it's also the way we cover it and the way that the news media quite often pushes, uh, relentlessly pushes news at people 24 hours a day. Uh, often the angles are very negative and I think that contributes to that sense of, of powerlessness that you see in, in some of these quotes. Uh, and then also in the, I mean, I think this is kind of important to distinguish different kinds of news avoiders. One of the things we did this year in the 2023 digital news report is we kind of asked people uh, who said they were avoiding the news how they were avoiding the news. So you had some people who we, we call periodic avoiders so, or consistent avoiders. These are people who we saw listening to music radio and turning over uh, to another channel when the news was going to come on or scrolling through their social media feeds and scrolling straight past the, the, the news item. Uh, these tend to be people with low interest, low interest in news and politics. There's a second group of people who are more specific, and I guess that's more like some of the people who put their hands up earlier. Uh, so maybe uh, certain times of day or you limit how much time. I came over on the plane with somebody who said they limited the time to half an hour <laughs> news so they could get on with the rest of their day. Or they're avoiding particular subjects like the wars in Gaza and Ukraine. We hear that a lot in our research. And that's kind of linked to this idea of overload and self-care of people who are interested in news and politics but just want to protect themselves. So these are the different kinds of news avoiders, and we've tried, to some extent at least, to, to, to address both in this um, presentation. Yeah, before we go on. Before we go on, um, I'd like to add, that, um, in my view, it's probably very much um, a problem of being overwhelmed, of being too much content out there. That's also the result of a little LinkedIn research we've done among our people who are following us. Um, but then there's also a huge problem about relevancy. Uh, people who 
feel that the news is simply not for them because they don't cover their perspectives, they don't address their problems, their every life challenges, they don't even speak a language they do understand. Um, and um, because of that, they, you know, most of, a lot of them have never really developed a habit of following the news because they think the news is simply for other people. And I think that's a problem that needs to be addressed because, you know, we want democracies with informed citizens, right? So we should really think about strategies to counter news avoidance, not just for the better of our industry, but also for the benefit of our societies. Perfect. So we're, we're now going to turn to the more um, uh, to the actual strategies, and uh, so we've come up with seven uh, different ways in which we can at least begin to counter news avoidance. So, firstly, this idea of keeping it simple, keeping it brief, and keeping it useful. And you know, quite often we take a huge amount for granted as journalists. Uh, we often write for people like us. We write for other journalists uh, who are super interested in news. Uh, we use overlong words. We try and cram another detail into the story. Um, and uh, Ros Atkins, who's here, you may have seen him earlier in his book, The Art of Explanation, uh, you know, talks so eloquently about this need to simplify. He talks about short sentences, economy of writing, what you leave out as being as, as important as what you leave in, but also about tone and authenticity and communication and the way in which, you know, as you do that, you connect the dots. Uh, so in a world of abundant information, I think there's a real premium on finding and presenting those nuggets, compressing and curating and saving people time rather than wasting people's time. And this clearly works in that explainer formats. You've probably seen it in, in what you do as well. Many other people have taken Ros's work and, 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 uh, and done the same thing. And, it, and it's really kind of working with audiences, I think. A second example, um, which you may not be so familiar with, is a, is a newsletter called The Knowledge, a UK-based uh, newsletter. It was actually formed during, during COVID. Uh, it takes you through, in five minutes, uh, a beautifully um, illustrated, wittily written um, set of stories that set you up for the day. And a lot of this is really curation. It's not original journalism, but a lot of thought goes into that curation. And in terms of results, what they've seen uh, in the last 18 months is a doubling, 225,000 subscribers. And it's very much constructive. They, they specifically look for stories that are not too gloomy. Uh, so there's a fantastic example this week of uh, some penguins. You might have seen it, emperor penguins going off a, a cliff in, in, in the Arctic or Antarctic, I'm not sure which. Um, uh, but it was, you know, it was part of that mix. And then, of course, that's it, you're done. You have five minutes, that sense of relief that you've finished the news. Uh, so th those are some examples. Yeah, we, we need some breaks, that's, uh, that's true. Um, at the same time, these are like examples of you know, people trying to you know, improve existing products or invent new ones, um, but they're kind of, you know, um, traditional still. Um, so at the Bond Institute, we're also thinking about new innovative ways to uh, develop news that address also the needs of people who, as I said, do think the news are not for them at all. So currently we're in a, dis a discussion with a local news outlet, and they are thinking about using AI to, this is not an AI talk, but just for once, uh, they are thinking about using AI to uh, produce simpler versions of the news that they are producing anyway. So what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, I think um, simple, there's many ways to get to simpler. Uh, I, I was watching a session earlier where Afton Poston were talking about making the news more accessible to people who couldn't read in Norway. Apparently there's 450,000 people in Norway, that's about a tenth of the population, who either don't read or find it difficult to read. And so creating AI versions in audio, taking text stories and turning them into audio, was one solution to that. So that's a great example of where AI can help with this idea of simplicity and making the news more accessible. Another great example, um, TLDR, the, the rappler in, in the Philippines is using AI to take stories and convert them to short nuggets that really work with young people. So this idea of, you know, how do you reach young people at the same time as old people? 
uh, with the same number of staff. Uh, we don't know if this is going to work, but I think that AI is definitely going to play a part in that relevance discussion that, that, that you came up with. Yeah, definitely. And I just visited the Repla uh, website, and you can also um, leave an emoji whether you liked um, a story and how do you feel after having read a particular story, uh, which I think is also a great way of you know connecting a little more with Absolutely. your audience. Yeah, you may have seen Artifact, um, where you could convert stuff into uh, you know news stories into summaries and then you could convert it into emojis to tell the story of emojis, tell the story in a poem, you know, mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's the what's what's second uh, 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 key strategy? So our next strategy that we um, uh, discovered during our little research was that we really felt that producing powerful and relatable human stories um, does help to address audiences that uh, tend to avoid the news because um, it really speaks to their information needs and that's what we're talking here. How can we address people's information needs much better? And as everyone knows, the Writers Institute and Nick, uh, we are pretty new. So with the Bonn Institute, we are working with media companies and we are also doing research in order to find out how we could better put people's needs at the heart of journalism. And one research we did last year was about uh, war reporting and we wanted to find out what do people actually want from us journalists when we're talking about wars and conflicts. And um, it was uh, actually um, that people, they don't want us to just report the positive or, and they know that there is no solution to ongoing crisis and wars. Um, but they want us to look out for powerful human stories they can relate to how people are coping even in the middle of really terrible crises, how they're helping each other, how they are like trying to survive and um, and um, not being, you know, um, just pessimistic about um, their daily lives. So um, that's something um, that people really want, and that's also something, I think we have a little example, um, that actually really works for media companies as well. So tell us a little bit about this. This, this is a Deutsche Welle example, right? And it's, exactly. Um, um, it, it's obviously a very serious story. This is a Turkish earthquake, but... Um, yeah. So this is a, uh, a story, and uh, Yasmin is some here from Deutsche Welle, um, and uh, they are paying very close attention to human stories, even in times of war and crisis. And this is a story about Ukrainians helping in Turkey after the terrible earthquake. And of course, this is not representative of what was happening on the ground, but this is what was also happening, and this is a glimpse of hope in the middle of chaos and despair, and that's what people are really looking for as the head of news um, that um, I met during a training um, last month said. They sa he said, people are literally digging for content on our websites and our channels that, you know, have some hope in them and that are not just doom and gloom. And a second example. Yeah, this is uh, a, an example that I also particularly like. It's, it's totally different. You can find it on the New York Times website. And it's a great example of a really human um, story which zooms into a conflict and really uh, tells the story of the Israel-Gaza conflict on a very granular level by telling a powerful story about children and young people swimming together in a pool in Jerusalem as they have done before October 7 and the pain they have and the suffering and the hopes and all the emotions that come into play in this you know really really terrible situation and this is something you as a reader can really relate to and I've really it also myself found myself reading it like uh, from beginning till end and um, I guess New York Times might have registered a really long reading time which is good news for them as a publisher as well. I think I mean there's, there's, a, there's a discussion about objectivity isn't there because you know it used to you know how, whether you can show empathy and at the same time be objective and I come from a sort of BBC background which is all you know in the past it would have been about being quite distant um, and I think you know a reinterpretation of of, inter uh, um, uh, of of objectivity 
is is really still I think now is much more about connecting with people. Mm -hmm. That's um, uh, you know you can do object objectivity and impartiality in, in different ways over time. Yeah, I mean this is also the, the beauty of digital media that you can really tell what people like and what they want. And what they want is uh, reporters who are being empathetic while maintaining that professional distance. Um, I am a trained mediator myself, and this is what we learn in mediation that we do have to show empathy. That you know we can relate to people and their stories while not sharing their feelings. Uh, and I think this is the way to go if we also want you know, to create more trust in the people we speak to, um, but also in the people who later on consume the content we've produced. Okay, strategy number three, um, listen to audiences and act on it. This may sound obvious. <laughs> we often think we do this. Um, but we find again and again in our research that uh, there's a mismatch between what audiences uh, want in terms of gender, in terms of tone, and what newsrooms are providing. Um, that doesn't mean to say you have to give people exactly what they want or dumb down what you're, you're providing, but marrying that vision and mission that you have with something that's really going to resonate. Um, there are lots of ways to close that gap, but one of the things I really like is sort of deep listening exercises where you take the time to go and talk to a range of your target audience. A couple of examples, so this was the Huffington Post a few years ago, uh, Lydia Polgreen, editor-in-chief of Huffington Post, when she came in, she did this big listening exercise, and she was particularly concerned with, with the people she called the unused, so people who weren't using the news. Uh, and trying to uh, talk to them and understand what they wanted, how news, why it didn't fit into their lives, what kind of news they were getting in different ways. And, um, you know, there's no silver bullet, but out of those conversations came uh, a whole load of insights that they could do something about. So it led to uh, setting up new beats on subjects like mental health, for example, um, but also a whole range of ch changes in terms of, of, of tone of voice, uh, insights around the fact that people who are unused, um, they thought that facts were important, but they found that emotion, empathy, uh, humanity, the things we've just been talking about, they were the things that really resonated with that group of people. Uh, and again, that really sort of fed back into her strategy uh, when she took over at Huffington Post. A second example, uh, Swedish radio, again, this is from a few years back, but engaged in a massive listening exercise linked to the election and to the fact that there were 10 million people in Sweden and the population had changed. So go and talking to people, what, what was really important to them in the election, getting questions that could then drive you know, conversations and questions to the prime minister. So it really affected the debate. Um, and, you know, I think what I like about this is we often delegate the listening to audience research departments, but in this case, it's so much more powerful if you get the journalists to do it because it's really kind of embedded in their thinking going forwards. Mm -hmm. You have an example. Yeah, that's exactly also what uh, German magazine Die Zeit is currently doing. Uh, we're going to talk about solutions a little later, so this is about how you can actually listen and figure out what kind of topics are relevant for your audience. And the site is currently asking their uh, audience, what kind of problems do you have? So they're, they're saying, we would like to have your problem, but we'd also like to have solutions. And they are feeding um, those uh, kind of problems and solutions into a big database. Um, I just uh, talked to them, they said they're already getting hundreds uh, of uh, uh, problems and solutions and they're most probably going to visualize them in the next couple of months, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, and, you know, that way they're really making sure that they address those things that are relevant for their audience. And uh, from my work at Deutsche Welle, which is an international broadcaster, I know that people worldwide are more interested in solutions other people have found for problems that anyone has. So Die Zeit is a really good example of how to combine listening to your audience with also focusing not just on problems, but also on solutions, which actually, in my uh, view, is much more objective than anything else. <laughs> Back to that objectivity discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, another strategy that many publishers are using um, to get closer to audiences is the user needs model. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It's a model that came out of BBC audience research. Originally, it's been uh, evangelized by Dmitry Shishkin amongst any, uh, many of you will know uh, Dmitry. And it kind of makes explicit a range of different user needs 
that people have. And obviously, you know, updating people is, is, is a very strong and important user need. But there are other things like, you know, learning stuff or being inspired, um, uh, uh, making you feel better about the world. So some of these sort of core user needs. So out of that user research, um, the BBC and others uh, identified there was a mismatch and the, um, the, to push the dial towards uh, user needs. And it will be different for different audiences. Uh, I think this is interesting, uh, but obviously there are also dangers of using data if it's not based on your target audience and actually combining it with really good audience understanding. Uh, otherwise, you get to the wrong solutions. I don't know what you think about some of these data ways of, of, of doing things. Um, I, I actually think the user needs model is very helpful mm -hmm. because it points you to a deficit that you're having. Um, most you know, newsrooms produce far too much update me content and 80% some newsrooms find out 80% is not being read by the audience. So it's, it's a good way to understand your deficit. At the same time, um, it doesn't help you finding ways to produce more of the content that you're not so much used to producing, like give me perspective or inspire me. And um, so they're good, but they're not the one silver bullet uh, that a lot of newsrooms might think they are. I think we'll come back to that. You know, I, th I think that's one of the reasons why we've got sort of seven things, because uh, you know, there are many different kinds of avoidance and there is no silver bullet, but lots of techniques that can help and, and clearly are helping and driving, um, demonstrably um, driving improvements. Number four, Ellen. Yes, uh, number four um, is... Um, a, um, a strategy that's really dear to my heart because we're talking about relevancy here, relevancy for our audiences, and therefore we really need to, to take people um, very seriously. Um, they are people, they are not users. So they're human beings, um, and they belong to very often to different communities than we do as journalists. Um, and many of these people in these communities think uh, the news will come to me. I don't really have to look out for the news. Um, but unfortunately, and I think yeah, we have this example, that is not always true. Um, for instance, uh, the city newsroom from New York, from New York uh, has actually tried to produce um, uh, an article that is really, really uh, uh, relevant for um, their respective audience, but the audience doesn't go on, on the internet to look for that sort of information. And what I found interesting is that uh, the, the city really took that problem seriously and they sent postcards to the people they thought should be interested in um, their article. And um, at the same time, they did an A-B test and ran Facebook ads um, with the same sort of information, telling people, look, we've researched this sort of topic. Would you like to come to our website and have a look? And they actually found that sending postcards was a much more powerful way to address this specific community, which was not on the internet all the time, which was not so much on social media, and that they still wanted to inform. And I, I found that very interesting, actually. So that's a kind of bottom up, uh, mm -hmm. but also um, a lot of top down, great examples as well. Oh yeah, of course. Um, so um, the Canadian uh, public broadcaster Radio Canada and National just uh, released their um, strat in, in uh, national indigenous uh, strategy um, because they also realized that they themselves um, as most of us actually, are not as diverse when it comes to people in our newsrooms as we should be in order to reflect the needs of our audiences. So that took that challenge very, very seriously and they uh, developed a strategy um, which is not just um, about uh, including people with a um, certain uh, a social uh, demographic background, but also indigenous people. And, you know, they really went about it very, very seriously. And I think we have a little video that shows how, how powerful the release was. Let's give it a whirl. Gwei, uh, everyone. Ajiba Lewin, thank you very much for being with us today. The Lewis Nil Nick Maloney, that's my name. I'm a Maliseet or Willista Gwe fellow from the territories of the Wabanagi Confederacy in the Atlantic region. Um, I work for, yes, whew. 
I work so, at CBC's uh, unscripted sort of unit. Really, I work in documents. Really uh, heartwarming event. Yeah, wasn't it? it was. And I think it's really, really important that we understand that you know what we consider as relevant is not relevant for our audiences, and that we really need to include as many people with, with as many diversity markers as possible. So, for instance, me as a, a single parent, a female founder in the journalism industry with a working class background, um, somebody told me I'm pretty diverse for European standards already. <laughs> <laughs> which is also an indication and for, <laughs> which is an indication for, uh, you know, not every newsroom is the same, not every audience is the same, so we have to address this problem of diversity very individually per organization. I think, I mean, the other interesting thing is people often talk about diversity in terms of sort of equity, um, and that potentially that might, you know, cost more. There'll be additional costs involved. But um, uh, there's some recent work done by Richard Addy and Luba Kosova, who are here in Perugia as well. I'm not sure if they're in the room, uh, just uh, they're in the room, yeah. Um, uh, which looks at the economic benefits of closing the gender gap specifically. And what they found was that somewhere between 11 billion and 38 billion pounds is being wasted by the news industry if you look out over 10 years. Because you're leaving behind, you know, um, a, a significant proportion of, of women and of, of course of other diverse groups. Yeah, absolutely. So our uh, fifth strategy um, is uh, creating more engaging di digital formats. Uh, so it's less about you know the agenda and the topics, it's more about the way in which you tell those stories. Uh, we know from uh, research that people, uh, many people find it, I mentioned it already, find it hard to read in text um, especially on a phone, which is why what you're seeing at the moment is a lot of young people embracing audio, embracing video, and that's why publishers are also building short-form video into strategies as, as, as one example. So this is Le Monde as, as an example of a, a newsroom that's really lent into this. It hired a team of young journalists between 24 and 32 who understand the language of young people and of TikTok uh, and other short-form formats, and they've had a lot of success by marrying that with their mission, which is about the mission to explain. I'm just gonna play a very short version just to give you a sense of what that looks like. This is about King Charles. So, you know, they're using uh, techniques like drawing, um, uh, memes, you know, a whole load of different, this is not television, this is, this is really about uh, speaking a different language, um, but it is about serious storytelling, it's about that combination of, of, of things. Um, also from France, this is a, a, a you know slightly different. This is a little bit more like Ros Atkins, actually. A, um, a young journalist called Hugo de Crypt. You probably heard of him. Uh, he's actually um, called Hugo Travers. He's uh, 26. He's become a real go-to source for news uh, with young people. He's really connecting uh, with a combination of things like explainers. That's where the name de Crypt comes from. Um, but also a range of other uh, other formats. He has 14 million uh, followers across so, uh, his social media accounts, uh, 5.7 million on, on TikTok and 3 million or so on YouTube. Uh, and we, in the digital news report this, this year, the one not yet published, we've been looking at where people are paying attention and young people are paying attention to this guy uh, and the average age is, uh, of his audience is, is 27. So this is stuff that's really working, um, but it's also you know good journalism. And from Germany. Yeah, again, from it's Germany. Like yeah, I, I think <laughs> so. The I think the audience of young adults is a, an audience that a lot of you know news organizations are trying to address. And uh, German Tagesschau, which is uh, the German published broadcasting news show, they are um, experimenting with a new format which is called accurate, akkurat. And it looks like a pr very promising uh, a way to address younger audiences, given the reach of the four videos they, that they've just released during that trial period. Maybe we can have a look. So it doesn't really look fancy. Um, and I think the main challenge here is to combine an existing brand, which is like the most trusted news brand in Germany with the highest trust rates like every year, 
with um, the approach to reach younger audiences. And I think um, that they have done it in a pretty good way. It's still very serious. Um, it's still got elements of the target show, of the original show, so that they can create some brand identity or maintain it. And at the same time, they're including memes. And first of all, they're also trying to address problems that the target show would never cover, not in that extent. Um, and that, that uh, are very, very relevant for that young audience that they want to reach. Uh, in that case, the um, housing crisis for students. Right, so it's partly about agenda, it's partly about format. Um, also from a public broadcaster, um, SVT actually be, have pioneered a lot of new formats for young people. Um, this is one they released uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, or just before Christmas. And it's called uh, Progress, obviously not really called Progress, this is the English translation through Google Translate, a bit of AI. Um, and, and what it is, it's kind of a one minute uh, forward looking um, story about what the future could look like. Um, uh, and they're, you know, sometimes they're inspiring, sometimes they're just quirky. There's one there about, um, which I particularly enjoyed, Oli, a, a, a furniture designer who is growing a chair out of mushrooms. And then in the video, he eats it at the end. So uh, quite interesting. Um, uh, and, and they're doing a lot of really interesting stuff. Again, driven by data, what's really working. And then they kind of double down on that. Uh, I hate that phrase, double down. Um, rethinking political coverage. Uh, so strategy number six, politics is the thing people complain about a lot. Um, and you know we, we put here constructively because uh, much of political coverage is not constructive. Uh, according to audiences. It's often shouty, it turns people off, uh, it focuses on the horse race rather than the underlying policies. Journalists, um, you know, trying to catch out politicians or the other way around, you know, this is one of the major critiques, um, but, but what, what is the alternative? Well, I remember watching uh, a political debate show with my daughter, who's like now 17, and she's like looking at me and asking me, Mom, why are these people shouting to each other? <laughs> And she just didn't get the concept. And um, uh, it's actually something you always show in your reports as well, that especially young people are really worried about, you know, debates derailing because of um, how they are portrayed, the debates are portrayed in the, in the news media. And um, German uh, ZDF, which is also a public broadcaster, is very successful now for, for a long time with a show that tries um, to also um, include a gamification approach. Uh, it's called 13 Questions, um, and it addresses a polarizing questions that are you know, heatedly debated in German society, and maybe we can have a look at the trailer. Dramatic music. And that one's about whether the uh, AFD should be banned. Or yeah, the, the right-wing AFD should it be banned or not. And the thing is, uh, we don't have just two positions here because most people just don't have an either pro or con view on you know uh, polarizing questions. They are somewhere in between. I say 80% of the people are grey or maybe colourful and not black and white in their opinions. So that show tries to address this, and uh, they also pick the, the candidates for the show very carefully. They put a lot of time in really finding a diverse range of people um, when it comes to their backgrounds, but also to their opinions. And then they make them move during the discussion. They move back and forth, either more towards each other or, you know, they, they back from each other, which shows that, you know, you don't either agree or not agree. Right. You know, the, and the, this the is the nuances. These are the nuances, and this show is a, a, a pretty good success, actually, on YouTube for for the broadcaster. Um, I, th I think it's also um, when we're talking about political coverage. I think it's it's useful to think about political podcasts, which have been hugely successful and have grown very fast over the last five or six years. And that's because many of the most successful ones aren't doing the update me news. They're either trying to explain things or they're, they're doing things differently. Um, this is an example from the UK. It's called The Rest is Politics. It's the number one podcast in the UK, and it's a politician from the left, or a sp sp spin doctor from the left, and a politician from the right. And uh, as they say here, they disagree agreeably. 
uh, and that's the, that's the idea. And often the audience is at the heart of it, so they're answering list, listeners' questions. They have whole editions which are purely about answering listeners' questions. They go on the road, so there's physical contact all over the country. They've sold out the Palladium in, in eight minutes, I think, twice. Um, so that's, that's connecting um, with people in, in different ways, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's trying to deal constructively in a long-form format, actually, with, uh, with news that attracts younger people too. And another example from the BBC, a similar kind of thing, this is, um, this is a podcast they recently started called Antisocial, and it takes uh, issues that have blown up on social media, so the so-called culture wars, like gender or immigration or whatever it is, and then it slows it down in a structured way. So it brings in evidence uh, and wider perspectives that you wouldn't normally hear. Uh, so literally antisocial, as it says on the tin, is turning angry faced emojis into understanding, which I think is a great <laughs> idea. Uh, uh, it's still early, so not quite clear how yeah. successful that is. Um, We've come to the seventh solution. The seventh, seventh. solution could, could be a movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, solutions, yeah. So let's talk about solutions. Um, and I, we also promised to deliver some data. So um, I, I'd really like to talk about a little experiment that we've run with uh, a German regional newspaper for six months. Um, we. Um, we help them produce solutions-oriented content um, to address one problem that they have, which is the inner city development, which is like really devastating. They have been reporting on that problem for 30 years. I know that because I am from that region, and it's always been that like, like that. And uh, we help them to address um, solutions to that problem that can be found elsewhere. And turned out that um, actually people like that sort of content. Um, now the evidence, <laughs> um, in a way um, that we could really see from the data that they stayed longer, that they engaged more with the content, um, and that basically uh, the newspaper was keeping their readers happy, happier when they also addressed solutions to problems that everyone know about, knew about. Um, and I think this is like really adding value to your reporting if you don't get stuck with a problem, but also look out for who's doing it better. And um, actually this is also putting pressure on politicians, which is also like right. a nice side effect of uh, solutions-oriented reporting, because you can not just blame somebody, but also you know, talk about who's doing it better. Yeah, so and why it's don't really you interesting do it? to see solutions journalism. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, it's happening a lot in Germany, but it's happening in many other countries. It's as well. happening in in many other countries. We are working closely with the solutions journalism network. They have like made a great success with promoting their model. We also find it very helpful. Um, but if you're following, tr trying to follow the four pillar model that they have introduced or not, I think the main thing is that you understand that you are creating value when you're not, in, not getting stuck with the problem, but also look for a potential solution. Uh, so just one, one from me on, um, on solutions or more positive approaches relating to climate change, which is obviously you know, a, a huge issue. And this is um, Elena Wood, who is a sustainability scientist. She's not a journalist. Uh, she calls herself sustainability scientist, activator, climate communicator. Uh, you can find her at the Garbage Queen on TikTok and Instagram. Um, and you know she's obviously very aware of the dangerous state of the climate. She doesn't underplay that. Uh, she's also aware of the need to give people hope as well and, and to provide balance in that reporting. Uh, so in her feed, she's known for debunking climate doomism. Um, uh, she's also done a lot of amazing research on, on eco-anxiety and how to manage it. And one of the ways she does it is she produces a bulletin every week called Good Climate News, um, which is just a very simple list of stories. Um, and that has got her uh, 400,000 followers on TikTok, uh, 200,000 on Instagram. I'll just play a little brief part of it to make you feel a little bit happier. Here's this week's Good Climate News. Because it's important to remember that we are making progress on addressing the climate crisis. The United States has finalized stricter emission standards for vehicles that will help save billions of tons of emissions and millions of lives over the next 30 years. Fishing is now banned in over 60,000 square miles of ocean near Antarctica. I love the way she does it with a smile on her face. Um, and in the comments, if you look on the, in the comments on TikTok, there is almost always someone just saying, thank you, you know, I was so depressed about things, you've really uh, lifted my spirits. So 
this is all about balance, right? It's not yeah. about um, one thing or another. Yeah. Um, very often, you know, these kinds of format get blamed for being activists. Yeah. So, what do you think about it? Um, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of different ways of doing it, and um, you know, I, what I like about Elena Wood is it's not it's not activist. You can see it, it's just with a smile on her face. She's just factually telling these stories. Um, you know, she has a position, which is that you know she wants to communicate this stuff in the best possible way, and that climate doomism we know from the research is turning a lot of people away. So it's about trying to find new ways of doing it. Yeah. yeah. And I also find it interesting that it's not possible to have no impact. So either you know you contribute to the phenomenon of uh, acquired helplessness among your audience by just promoting doom and gloom, or you might also promote to activating people. So you always have to make a choice. Right. You have a final uh, example. I have a final example, which is um, also um, from a regional German newspaper. Um, I have done a little research um, amongst them, um, as I see more and more good news newsletters popping up. Uh, and that's for a reason they happen to be pretty successful. Um, so um, some produce original content for the newsletters, like this one is from southern Germany. They actually let their journalism trainees produce the newsletter with uh, uh, a solution-oriented content from their region um, because they initially thought they might address young people with that sort of newsletter. Turned out that everyone is interested, so um, the newsletter is growing rapidly. Um, and there are a lot of other news outlets who are also producing the sorts of newsletters. Some are just putting together content that they had produced anyways, but in general, um, people feel that these are successful little products um, for young people, but also for other people who also happen to be news avoiders, as one uh, of the people I spoke to told me, um, that are now engaging with a traditional newspaper. Great. So. Um before we just do the takeaway slide and move to questions, we've got about 10 minutes left, I, I just wanted to share this chart from our Reuters Institute uh, Leaders Survey, which we do at the beginning of every year. We asked 300 newsroom leaders from 56 countries to what extent they were going to be focused on some of these approaches this year. And, and kind of, there's good news and bad news in this. I think, you know, the real focus on understanding the value of explanatory journalism really works for young people and old people and it fits the culture of many newsrooms. Uh, a bit of pick up on solutions and constructive, um, but if I'm quite honest, slightly disappointing um, in some other areas like simpler to understand or you know, making the news more accessible. Um, I don't know what you make of these, uh, these results, Ellen. Well, um, I also think there's a lot of good things happening um, and people are realizing that they have to move on and that they have to address other uh, topics that they have done in the past. At the same time, I share your disappointment from time to time. Um, and I also try to understand that it's really hard to change a professional attitude that you've ha had for years or you know, decades working in the industry, that you're the one who addresses all the negative. And um, it's so much easier to just you know, go on a new platform or buy some piece of machine, AI, whatever, than changing your own habits, like your professional habits. And um, that's painful and it takes some time. So we're talking here about a transformational process. Um, I'm very, very certain that this will continue because otherwise we'll just, you know, become irrelevant as an industry. So there's no way around, you know, dealing with these topics seriously. Great. So that's our menu. That's uh, the seven strategies for countering news avoidance. You can read them. Simplicity, uh, powerful and relatable human stories, listening to the audience and acting on it, taking communities seriously and building more diverse newsrooms, the new formats. Rethinking political coverage is an important one, and then uh, looking for solutions and hope. It's relevant. Um, uh, all of the examples that we've talked about, or most of them, are in the Reuters in, uh, on the Reuters Institute website. Currently, the article that we've jointly written, and um, so feel free to, to look at them there. But we have, I think, eight minutes left, something like that, for questions. So um, we have somebody in the room, I think, with a microphone. Um, so yeah, we've got one down here to kick us off. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we have a very serious problem here with one of the solutions that you proposed, which relates to all the others. The one on the French influencer, Hugo de Crypt, Hugo Travers, that you mentioned as an example. It, it is clearly based on the, on the numbers, a huge success by the audience. And you mentioned that it's good journalism, that the average follower is 27 years old. I teach at three, journalism at three French universities. I ask my students every year at the beginning of the course, how do they f who do they follow? How do they follow the news? 
always Hugo de Hip comes on top, by far. Yeah. He's a huge success. We look at it together. It's terrible journalism. Okay. So, uh, and I asked, uh, why do they follow it? And I said, it's, um, it's simple, it's short, and it's entertaining. That's the usual answer from all my students. And I said, okay, you guys are university students, so it means you are all stupid because you need something simple. You are all very busy looking at your screens because you need something short. And news, you need to be entertaining. Otherwise, if it's complex and serious, you won't follow. So it's very worrying. It's excellent journalism for 12-year-olds, but I'm not sure that's the answer to engage serious audiences. It's very, very basic journalism, what okay, Hugo de Kip does, I, in my I, opinion. I think whatever you think of uh, Hugo de Kip or a particular influencer, we can't ignore the fact that um, uh, there's much we can learn from influencers. People are paying attention to influencers. Now, it may be that some of the things they're doing are about the format and the storytelling, and I've seen some great influencers who tell fantastic stories. I don't know an, uh, enough French to be able to tell, tell about Hugo de Kip, but I think there is much we can learn around formats from them. The important thing is that we uh, hold on to our mission about what journalism is, and we interpret you know, that combination of trying to understand. So, I mean, it, we shouldn't just ignore Hugo de Kripp, right? Why is he so successful? We need to understand that and then work out how that's um, relevant to us. Uh, other questions or thoughts or contributions of what, what's working for you? Yeah, you've got one at the back left. Hi. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my, my name is uh, Katrina Mahdalova. I'm data-driven journalist, uh, and uh, I'm uh, almost always trying to keep uh, the stories uh, as simple as, as possible. But sometimes uh, uh, we need to keep an attention for. Uh, um, well, m maybe I, I should explain. Uh, we we uh, usually cut our stories in, into the series, so. Uh, what, what, what uh, my question is: How to keep an attention for for other uh, uh, <laughs> pieces uh, uh, of of the story? Um, so, I mean, I think we're, we're living in the attention economy. That doesn't mean to say everything has to be a minute. Um, chunking things up is one strategy that people use. So, uh, Swedish television, for example, the one I was talking about, have put things into playlists so that young people are getting news about the economy, for example, in one minute chunks, but they kind of follow each other. So you build up depth through through that. In other cases, like the uh, Ros Atkins one I was talking about, you know, they're not a minute long. You know, quite often they're 10 minutes. It's about providing stuff, it's taking stuff out that otherwise might have been 30 minutes and bringing it down to 10 minutes. So yeah, this challenge between being brief and dumbing down, um, yeah. what, what do you think? Well, I, find, I find it hard to give advice in you know, yeah. a format that I don't know, bluntly. <laughs> uh, at the same time, I, I also followed uh, Ross's uh, uh, talk here in Perugia, mm -hmm. and uh, one thing stuck with me, that he always tries to answer all the questions that he thinks the uh, audience might have, because you know, he really wants to be as relevant as possible. So just not make sure that you speak about what you want to talk about, but make sure to address the question that your specific audience might have and take time to really write them down before you start to produce a piece. Yeah, great point. Yeah, we have one at the front here. I'm from Finland, but I think that, at least for the Western world, one of the big problems is that when you look at or listen to the news, mostly we follow them on the internet, it's the same thing. You know, the same things are in the headlines. You can have all the human stories, all the diversity, but it's hidden there. So I think, uh, how do you think, what would be a way to make it more easily, you know, found and uh, right. accessible. Well, I, I don't think that the answer would be produce more content. <laughs> yeah, um, I think uh, relevancy is really key here, um, seriously, because we can we can see from the examples uh, that we gathered that those you know formats that really try to take the audience's needs seriously be it to be informed or to be entertained, honestly, um, it's crucial to really you know, pin down that you address an information need that exists and not that you think people should have. 
I think this is one of the key, you know, faults in our industry that we are still looking down on our audiences and, you know, tell them what is relevant today, whereas in their daily lives and struggles, something completely different might be relevant. And therefore, you know, all the strategies up here are actually maybe the best answer to your question. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's a combination, I think. You know, we definitely feel, f people feel that the, the difficult news, the negative news is crowding out other things they might be interested in. And so we need to make space for that. Mm. Whether you use a user needs model or however you think about it, you need to proactively make space for that diversity that we know audiences are interested in. And I think that will help to reignite interest in news. Mm. Yeah. We'll just take one more briefly, and I think we'll, we, we need to close after that. Uh, so just, again, to stand here near the front, if we can. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I just had a question about the good news um, and sort of listening to the audience who says I want good news, only because I'm a journalist from the United States, Philadelphia. And we had a whole section, we were listening to our audience, who said we're tired of the bad news, the negative news, we want good news, and we created a whole section that actually, I forget the, what the name was, but something as simple as good news. Um, and it was successful for a very brief time, and then it was absolutely not. And it was getting no clicks, and we thought we're giving the audience what they told us that mm -hmm. they wanted. And what was getting the clicks again was the stuff that they kept telling us, we don't want that. So I guess I'm wondering, what do you do when you think you're, you're you know, committed yeah. to, to, your, to your, yeah. your role as listening to the audience and it's not working. Oh, actually, I absolutely agree. And I, I don't know of any media outlet that's solely producing good news that's very successful because only good news are not, you know, relevant. Um, I think it's a mix. We have and it mix. doesn't. Yeah. I have, yeah, yeah oh, sorry. I, I understood. Yeah. Um, you put it in a different section. So have you experimented with just including the good, you know, on your regular reporting? Because you know, bad things are happening and good things are happening. It's, it might be also true that they are both just as relevant. Um, it's also part of the truth that the bad news will always get more reach um, because they trigger our instincts, survival instinct. Um, but it's, it might be true, you, ha you have to see, that people are spending more time, for instance, with, you know, um, content that is also giving them some hope and, you know, some good news. Uh, so, um, I hope this has not been too depressing as a session for you. Um, I hope we've provided some hope um, and, and some, 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 some ways of just not sort of wallowing and saying it's all dreadful, but there are some practical things we can do. That's the idea. Do look at the, the article on the website. I hope you found it useful, and thank you very much to Ellen as well. Thank you. Thank you. Experience Umbria through the European Union's cohesion policy.